thanks everybody for having me come and chit chat about this today. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm Susie Hagee and I'm the Region 1 Landscape Architect and I'm the Region 1 Water Quality Manager, wear two hats. Um, we're going to talk about the establishment phase at CDOT and um, as by the title, you can see that there's two. There's the landscape establishment phase and the post-construction establishment phase. And I'm going to talk about both of those and how they're good tools for CDOT. But since this is a swamp design class, I'm not going to get into how to do a task order on post-construction establishment or any of those items. Um, that's a different class and um, we will get into that some other time. So as we mentioned before about reveg, um, one of the problems that we've had at CDOT is having open permits um, for a long time. And we've been focusing for the last several years on how can we reduce CDOT's risk? How can we have more stabilized roadsides after projects? And now with the health department changes in um, COR 400,000 or whatever number, how many zeros um, with the new stormwater permit, um, we've had to make sure that we can still get that revegetation, make sure we're getting grasses instead of just weeds on our roadside. So, so an establishment phase um, this is what I'm going to talk about today. What's the establishment phase? Um, what was the problems? How we solved them? What kind of criteria we created? Some tips and tricks, where to find more information, and obviously questions and answer answers. So here is this really cool um, graphic representation of the phases. So we have design, construction, establishment, right? We also have some of the roles. We have the contractor's role, the construction engineering role, environmental um, support role. So we've identified this as this establishment phase. So that is that time period that is after the contractor has seeded until we have full vegetation final step stabilization. Um, we've split that at CDOT into the possibility of having a landscape establishment phase, LEP, or post-construction establishment phase, PCEP. And as you can see on this orange line here, the construction by the prime contractor is the landscape establishment phase. And then we have construction by a different contractor, which is the PECP, um, post-construction establishment contractor. So, and when I mean construction, I really mean seating, or um, we also can do corrective work, monitoring work, establishment phase. So how did we get to this? You know, there was a pretty momentous um, thing that happened in 2016. The Federal Highways Administration, who does a lot of our rulemaking also, agreed that until final stabilization, that was part of project delivery. So it's part of the design, federally funded available, um, it's part of construction. And, and so they really took ownership of all of that phase, which allowed federal funding to um, be available for this. So this could also be, this is revegetation, re mitigation of wetlands, restorations of habitat, all parts of that growing stuff that are part of a project. They also agreed that we could do a one or two year landscape establishment period and it can be performed by the prime contractor. So this is a big shift than what CDOT had been doing in the past. As we all know, construction is messy and we deserve disturb dirt, but this is not how we're gonna leave a project. At the end of that construction, we're gonna stabilize it. We're striving for 
and we are required to by that um, changes to the permits um, achieve that stabilization. And stabilization is not easy in Colorado. It takes a good three years on a really good project to get those native grasses to grow. And when the state is in drought conditions, which we have had a lot, um, it takes more years. And we've struggled at CDOT to achieve this project stabilization. And we've done that for several reasons. And here's this really long slide. Um, projects were not stabilized at the end of the contract. Contractors seated and project were closed and there was no accountability for the stabilization or vegetation performance. Um, stabilization problems were not, were not fixed. And those kinds of problems jeopardize our infrastructure, meaning uh, if you have a lot of slope and um, real erosion, it can start getting into the roads and the guardrails and, and that's not good. We had a lot of risks um, with our permitting, like stormwater permits, core permits, um, EPA. I a lot of love from EPA and CDPHE in the regulatory form. Um, we also didn't have um, a standard funding stream to fix this. And so we were digging in couch cushions and having bake sales. Okay, I'm joking. Um, about how to fix roadways after the project is done. And the regions, we have a um, RPP, which is a region something fund. It's not necessarily federal. Um, and we were having to use that instead of being able to use federal funds. And then to top it off, the Colorado legislation, uh, legislators did SB 26122, which said we have to close projects quicker and increase cash flows for other projects. And it just got to be really a problem. So we got everybody, we got the band together as a region, um, all the regions, and defined the problem and looked at what kind of things that we could do to deal with an establishment phase. And then we got some more love by the chief engineer in 2018 and um, about closing projects within a budgeted month time. So see here's some of the problems that we're talking about, roading slopes and um, guardrail that's gonna get undermined by stormwater. Here's some not enough coverage, no roadside stabilization. We have some real tire ruts. Hey Susie, on, on yeah. that picture that you just showed. Um, yeah. And going to that 70% rule, because I, I I know I've talked to someone at CDPHE and they were saying like 70%, like you, you should try and get it back to the old prairies like 200 years ago. And, and you guys kind of all, almost mentioned this twice, even in this presentation. So like, what if that roadway looked kind of like that before, especially the closer areas where maybe it was a little bit more salty and things were hard to grow. So what if that technically did meet the 70% before and after transects? Are you, are you guys like trying to turn up the volume on like, we just want even more? I don't think we're trying to turn up the volume. I would, yeah. I would be really careful about that. Yeah. Um, this is why doing transects uh, before we start construction is so very, very important because then we have that guidance. I would say that looking at this site and zooming in to, let's say, let's look at the where the telephone pole is and the right-of-way fence, and we can see um, that representative um, site that CDPHE was talking about, we can see that we had coverage there. And, and especially if we go down the road before we had construction disturbance, we can see that we had coverage there. Yeah. And so it's not that we're trying to ramp it up and do something above and beyond um, what's required. I think we need to strive for getting what's required first yeah. before we start ramping up. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, I guess I was just saying, this is clearly a, a picture of it. it's not coming back very well, but like, right. and these are not very common. If you go to a site that's like, hasn't been like any construction for 10 years, it, it's it's pretty thick. It, it's pretty it, well covered. Right. Yeah, right. but some, sometimes you do have trouble areas. And I know that that seems to like add months to the closing because I've been involved with the post-construction just waiting for the grass to grow. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 you were right. It takes like two years because there's always right. a couple places like this that right. like city of Aurora or someone just won't let you close the permit because of it, you know? Exactly. And so what do you do? The prime contractor's gone, who's got some money. And that's exactly the problem that we're trying to, to cool. solve here. Thanks. And here's more examples of that. And we have roads, uh, lots and lots of weeds and hiding in that picture is some um, roadside erosion. So you can see um, just beyond that, that big huge kosher bush is sitting down in a, in a, um, in a rill. So we created some criteria, which criteria is good. Um, we created these two tools, landscape establishment and post-construction establishment. We said that it's a one or two year period. It's performed by the prime contractor and it's part of project delivery and that's landscape establishment. We also have post-construction establishment period, which we did a contractor through a master agreement um, we have a fixed price we have, and that includes maintenance and material, or I mean, material and equipment. We have about 900,000 and it's statewide. And right now we're, um, doing training. And so, ta-da, here we are. Um, let's see, we are on the second contract now with the post-construction establishment. And we have lots of lessons learned. So don't get too embedded in the document that is gonna be up on the website because we do need to change it with our lessons learned. That's just a heads up. And so what does the landscape establishment period and the post-construction establishment period do? It allows us to have a a contractor with money to perform slope repairs, um, reseed. We can use it for wetlands. And um, uh, so we can replant trees or shrubs. We can even use it for formal established landscapes. So what is some of that criteria? Well, we established that we had different kinds of projects. So ultra low risk are small disturbances, low potential to discharge, small strips of disturbances. And so we said, no, we're not gonna hold the contractor, the prime contractor for one or two years on those. We're just gonna go straight to the post-construction establishment contractor and to the fund. So what that looks like is the prime contractor seeds, and then the project is closed, and then we can monitor the site and any repair work, we can hire the post-construction establishment contractor who's already on um, master agreement, and then we write a task order and they come out and do the repair work. So now we have a mechanism to, um, make those repairs. So the next project we looked at is the low risk project, one to 10 acres. Again, low potential to discharge, it's not near water, slopes are flatter than four to one. And so we would again do no landscape establishment period. We're gonna go straight to the PCEP. Please note this little footnote in the bottom. If we're talking about MS spores and we're talking about near water, and we're gonna kick it up to the medium risk. Questions? Susie, has any of this made it into the stormwater plans at this point for pay items or anything like that? Or is this still a landscape issue at this point? It's still considered, air quotes, extended landscape preservation. 
is the pay item. But we'll get to that in okay. Susie's tips and tricks. So good question. So medium risk projects, um, we're talking disturbances 10 to 20. I know people are like, what? What's a medium risk? Well, hang on a sec. Um, again, it can be one to 10, but it's also about being in a potential to discharge next to water in an MS4. Um, and we're also talking about slopes that are steeper than three to one, hard to establish areas, um, medians, south facing slopes, hard to establish soil types. Boy, those soil types make a big difference if you're trying to get stabilization in sand. Um, and we have some of that or in shale. And we, you know, we're, we're not Iowa with, with deep, um, dark, rich topsoil. This is a tough place to grow, Colorado is. So in this case, we would do a landscape establishment period, which is managed by the prime contractor and the project engineer. We would hold the project. So instead of the project being closed at um, after the contract seed, contractor seeds, it would be closed 12 months from that time. And we're establishing, we're starting to get estimates on 15 to 30,000, let's say, for that um, landscape establishment lump sum. Realization, we still may need the post-construction establishment contractor and the fund after landscape establishment. So then we get into high-risk projects, 20 plus acres, high potential to discharge, slopes, hard to establish areas, innovative contracting, design, build, and CMGC, which please don't ask me what it stands for because I can't remember. Um, when we have wetlands with 404 permits or we have formal containerized landscape plantings, those would fall into the, under the high risk. And that means we get to have the 24 month um, pay item, a bigger budget and just getting everybody in the mindset that we will still have to use the PCEP contractor to fund after um, the landscape establishment. That's because several reasons. One, we're talking about a really large area. Second thing, if we're having wetlands, wetlands are averaging three to seven years in order for us to be able to close the core permit and get that wetland back to where the core, um, core of engineers says, yeah, this is good. Um, we're also talking about uh, habitat restoration, things like that. Those would all be under these high risks. Um, uh, when I'm talking about habitat restoration, I'm talking about section seven consultation. Um, so those those take a long time to get right off from, and, and remember, this is all still part of project delivery. So one of the things that we need to start doing is saying, hey, wait a minute, who is going to manage this, um, uh, post-construction establishment contract work. Um, and so we created uh, a process, um, if then statements, so is the project medium or high, then we use landscape um, establishment and it's managed by the prime contract or project engineer at CDOT. And then if, if, the, um, if it's not medium or high, it can go to post-construction establishment and it either be managed by maintenance or engineering. Um, and, but we still have to ask that if maintenance staff is able to do the work or if they're able to um, perform or manage the maintenance, uh, manage the post-construction establishment contractor. And unfortunately right now, our maintenance people are really, really understaffed. Um, they have a 30% vacancy rate. So this is something that for the CDOT people, this is staying with engineering versus something we 
um, send to our maintenance forces to manage. So um, here is information that swamp designers need to remember to put in. That um, the project special for when you're deciding on what to do, how are we going to establishment? How are we going to establish this project? We need to talk about it in the project with the project team. Um, we need to make sure that we've agreed upon it. We've looked at the criteria and determined, yeah, it's medium or high, and we're going to use landscape establishment, or that it's low and ultra low, and we're going to go straight to um, post-construction establishment. We're having the discussion with the maintenance forces um, before work completed with the project about who's going to perform the work. The reason why we say we need to have these decisions made by FIR is that currently there is, um, it's easy to make funding changes and um, how long your project is going to stay open prior to FIR. It is significantly harder to get more money after um, FOR and to hold the project open longer, the schedule post FOR, because there is a big shift in, in CDOT with our um, long-term funding. And so really those decisions are made at FIR just, and that's why we as design CDOT people are pushing hard for um, swamps to be really significant with quantities at FIR and it's really hard, I know, but it's because of this funding window closing at FAR that is driving that. Questions? Um, yeah. yeah, real quick, because I'm working on a swamp now where this may be involved and it's kind of cool to have like this, almost like a checklist of go through here and then you can see, and then we get to like, what's the amount of money, 15,000 or 30,000? Um, would it be, when do I bring this up? I, I mean, at, right now I kind of just want to email my like regional like RWPCM that we're working with and just be like, where do you, but they'll probably bounce it back and say, all these other people need to be involved and it needs to come in with the meeting, blah, blah, blah. So. Right, exactly. Um, I would, if it was me, um, talk with uh, the environmental project manager, yeah. I would talk with the project manager, um, and and say I need to bring up how are we going to do establishment period yeah and then here's the criteria looks like this project falls within this yeah so we need some pay items we need to to think about this and you know then and also drag your RWPCM in and say okay let's have this so who discussion. makes that final decision? Like, I mean, I don't just put in $15,000 or $30,000. Is that like yeah. kind of like all other folks, they just kind of come up with a number, send it to us, we put it in the pay item swamp area for the clients? And, and that's that's something of that discussion that can be had is, yeah. you know, what do we think this would be? You know, how much money is this? Here are some options, project team. Yeah. Well, this will be interesting because this will be the first time I really get to see it in action. So. Okay. Well, yeah. Um, you know, I'm just going to throw it out there, you know, for the CDOT project. If you need to phone a friend, you know, let me know. And, and I can I can help out with this um, carefully because, you know, I'm in region one and it's not cool to be like, hey, I'm going to tell you what to do in region five. Um, so landscape establishment period uh, and uh, I think it was Paul that asked me this question. Maybe it wasn't. Um, what are some of the items that are coming into the plan set? So we talked about the special provision. We need the pay item, landscape maintenance. Um, we need additional notes directing the establishment work. So we're talking about things like herbicide. Um, if you have a wetlands 
Um, we're talking about um, what kind of planting, um, additional plantings that may be required, or, um, you know, you can't just go in and, and spray wetlands, you have to wand spray them. Um, so those kinds of extra thinking um, would be really helpful so that the contractor knows what they're bidding on in that establishment phase. Um, also another trick is that you've got to make sure that everybody knows that there's a landscape establishment period as part of the contract, that it's a 12 or 24 month, and that the FHWA end date includes that because that's one of the driving forces um, of some of the Senate bill, whatever that was that the land, um, legislator put on us about closing projects timely. So that gives its transparency to say, yeah, we have this establishment period. Questions? Susie, it seems to me, this is Paul, um, yep. that a lot of this direction is almost going to have to come from the CDOT PM for design. Are they getting brought up to speed on this stuff too, so that they understand that, hey, this is now part of my list of things we need to make sure we have in our cost estimate and our pay items and all of that? Or are they just relying on the stormwater person directly to, to walk them through this? Where, where is that, where's that level of responsibility? Who's it fall on? I don't know the answer to that question um, about the whose responsibility is this. This is just getting started. These, um, this education portion, this was the first that we've been able to do this. Um, so I think your point of talking to the project engineers, talking to the resident engineers is well heated. They need to know that this is an option. This is another tool in our arsenal. Yeah, and I, I think it goes back to the decision on um, what is it ultra low risk? Is it low risk? And that's where all of this then stems out of. So it's got to get back to that step first to make sure right. that if it's the categorized correctly, the next steps follow in line. Right, right. Um, I will just share, and this is, um, I have a project up in the mountains right now, and we put in a 12-month um, establishment period. And we did something a little bit different this time. Instead of using the pay item, um, the 214, uh, with the 12-month on it, um, we put a note in that it was that we were going to have a 12-month establishment period. And then we wrote um, a project special provision that said how we're going to pay for this is um, through a force account and, and put money in a, in a landscape establishment force account as part of the project. Because then the force account is time and materials versus um, the contractor then can't put his loading on it. And so I'll, I'll have to circle back with everybody on how that worked, but we're still doing things creatively. We're still trying this out and um, seeing if something's easier, if it's fair to the contracting world. Um, and then we get the product that we need, which is stabilized roadsides, final stabilization that meets our regulatory requirements. So which pay item did you use in your swamp narratives and, and quantity list? So previously I would have used the um, landscape maintenance, um, landscape preservation, which has then a 24 or 12 month um, designation to it. And so this time I didn't, I used a force account, a landscape. Okay, so you didn't use both pay items. Nope. Okay. Nope. But I and I had a whole reved sheet that talked about this. Yeah, I was a little bit panicked. I went out in the fields and, and I'm looking, I'm like, no, no, I could have swore we put that in here. 
you know, that was like two years ago that we put it in. Um, and, and then finally got flipping through the plans and went, oh, look, here it is. Yay. And the contractor was like, darn it. I thought I was done. Um, so. And, and did that show up in your swamp plans, that pay item? Or was that elsewhere in the plans? It would have been elsewhere. Elsewhere, We actually, okay. in this situation, we took the reveg out of the swamp plan and had it as a reveg plan. Okay. So, and then referenced from the swamp, the reveg plan. It was a little bit more complicated of a project for reveg. We have wet, we have wetlands and some plantings, so that's why we um, pushed into this other, and we were on a creek. Susie, that was going to be my question: is that if you aren't going to use the general, or if the decision is made by the project team not to use the general contractor for restoration and to use um, a qualified PCEP uh, vendor? Sorry, um, then it does seem like you almost do have to ha make sure you don't have the pay items uh, associated with uh, post-construction landscaping stuff in the design bid build package for the general contractor. And that I think that you were alluding to that, but I just wanted to clarify that for the, the group. I would agree with that to not have those pay items in there. I have been, um, trying to put in my plans, region one plans, that this, the statement of after seeding, this project will, would be eligible for post-construction establishment phase, um, simply just to keep track of, oh my gosh, what were we trying to do here? Um, and so that's just something me and um, my two coworkers are trying to do on the region one side. It's not required, but it could be helpful. I think it's really helpful for the general contractor too, so mm -hmm. that they know if they are done after they seed or whether they're done after the permits are closed. And Correct. there's a big difference between that. So I would encourage this group to, again, just like Susie said, you know, start having those conversations. If the PM doesn't want to do that, then, you know, I think the more that these discussions are happening, the more there's gonna be a shift, right? To probably using more post-construction establishment phase funding. Um, and so I think you'll start to see that shift, but then I also think it's an opportunity to make sure the contractor, the general contractor is very clear what they're bidding on. Um, I was just reading the chats while we were talking and yeah, Scott for the, um, the number about extended landscape preservation. Um, and then, uh, Geo, yeah, we're trying to get that information out to our project engineers about what these tools are. Finishing up, um, there was, once upon a time, there was a design bulletin that went out and we'll put all of these on the Landscape Architect website. We have not done that yet. Um, there was, and, and some of that was an unfortunate pandemic. Um, we were finishing up some of this during the pandemic and it's just, there were so many other things to be worrying about. So we're picking it up again and getting the word out. And um, we also have how, to, what all, of, all you ever wanted to know about landscape establishment the roles and processes. Um, it's a long read. The person who wrote it is long-winded. Okay, I did it. Um, and then the CDOT people uh, talking about post-construction establishments, roles and processes. And, and this is how to make a task order and who to contact for those things and typical items. But in this arena of this class, this, you know, is basically swamp design. This is not something you would necessarily have to interact with. Like Scott, you might have to because, um, you know, some of the roles of post-construction establishment you have done at CDOT, maybe, maybe not. Um, so, 
questions. Just a real quick one, and this might be oh, yeah. easy. The LS unit, what does that stand for? I always have trouble finding what those things mean. Some of them are obvious, like linear feet, but LS, they also use it for like dewatering. Is that days lump, or just lump sum money? Sum. Oh, lump sum, duh. Okay, so mm -hmm. put in $15,000. That's what we'll put in there. Right. Or whatever the number is people agree on. Right. Okay, gotcha, right. gotcha, gotcha. Um, I've, for um, back in the day, Paul and I used to do formal landscaping and do um, irrigation taps. And so I would put in the lump sum down to the penny um, of what the irrigation tap was for Denver Water. And so then the contractor writes a check, takes it over to Denver Water and um, gets the water tap. So that's, that's why that lump sum. And I think that's where Susie was alluding to forced accounts can sometimes be helpful because otherwise you do have that lump sum. And mm -hmm. if it didn't spend that amount, it gets tricky with lump sum. Yeah. Anything else? Thanks for having me as your guest speaker today. It's nice to see a lot of familiar faces. Thank you so much, Susie. It was really insightful. I know I myself have looked through some of these documents and been a little bit confused. So I think this is a great opportunity for everyone here to kind of bring this into your projects and really keep that conversation going or even start that conversation. About and as, as you are using these tools, please give us feedback because we want our tools to be used. We want our tools to be useful. Um, and if you have something, you're like, what are you trying to get here? Um, boy, that is helpful. So please.